Hey, can someone take a picture of this and put it on the piazza? Or maybe I'll do it. Maybe no, 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 don't do that. Because then the other, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on Bryce Space. <laughs> this is gonna lead to a lot of trouble. This ends up in piazza. Uh, okay. Screen share. Screen two. So that's the breakdown of the exam in terms of like what you need to know. I think it's very clear on the exam prep. I If it's not in here, it's not going to be in the exam. So really, um, if you need any of these formulas, like what is Q, what is A, uh, well, maybe not HM, but what is omega low and omega high in the bandwidth, I, I'll give them to you um, if you need them. The So don't, don't memorize formulas, basically. Uh, I mean, HM, you should just be able to derive. That's why I think that, but you should just know what they mean, basically. A question. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we're gonna cover two things, and there's two questions, and I wonder, like, what the two questions are. <laughs> Go ahead. Do the equation sheet on right space be Uh, it's not. It'll be tomorrow. It'll be there tonight by midnight, I promise, okay. along with this thing. OK, so just know the parameters. That's it. You, you need to know how to identify whether something is a low pass, high pass, or band pass. And either from, like, if I show you this circuit, I tell you kind of like plus minus V in, and then I say V out. Should be able to tell me whether this is a band pass, high pass, low pass. Or if I give you H of S equals S over S plus one, you should be able to tell me whether this is a low pass or a band pass or a high pass. Um, if I give you, you should be able to tell me whether this is a low pass, band pass, or a high pass. I guess, does anyone know what this is? A low pass, high pass, or band pass? Yeah, it's a low pass. And then this would be a, well, a what? So how does the slope start? What's the response at zero, basically? Okay, so zero, and what's the response at infinity? Yeah, it's just one. So you do L'Hopital's, so you take the derivative of S, which is just one, you take the derivative of S plus one, which is one, and then, yeah. So it's just gonna be one. Uh, now for this one, what's the, how many, zeros do you have at zero? So it's like S over S plus some number. So it's a, yeah, yeah, I pass, I pass. Yeah, um, this happened several times in the quizzes, people would be like, this is a low pass. And it's like painful having to give them a zero because they, they, they knew it. <laughs> they just wrote the wrong word, right function. But uh, yeah, it's uh, in the exam, I don't have to look at it, so it's not gonna hurt me. <laughs> yeah, so just remember that. If, if you have two of these poles here and then one zero, then what that means is that it's gonna basically be like wee, and then eventually it's gonna hit one pole and then eventually it's gonna hit another. So that's band pass. 
So same number of zeros as poles is low as high pass. More poles means band pass. Uh, if there are no zeros at zero, it's a low pass. Um, and then there's this thing called band stop, but we're not covering that. Okay, so that's basically what you need to know what I mean by identify Butterworth filters. If you can do that, you're good. Um, oh yeah, yeah, second thing is you need to know, kind of identify the order and you just simply need to count the number of inductors and capacitors. So two inductors, second order, two inductors and a capacitor, third order, one inductor, first order, so on. Uh, just count them. Uh, no, no trick questions. Of course, you should be cognizant that something that looks like this is a first order, it's a second order circuit because these two things, you can collapse into one inductor. But I'm not gonna trick you. So for the purposes of the exam, you can just count them and don't not even think about all the kinds of weird ways that I can trick you and be evil. Um, just do be cognizant in real life that it doesn't translate so nicely. I'm just not gonna put it in an exam. This is just a waste. Um, yeah, it's just a waste of time. Okay. So the next thing is design low pass and high pass. That just means apply the little heuristic. You will get the formulas. You will get the like n is greater than or equal to. You have to remember that n is an integer, not a fraction or a yeah. So it can only be one, two, three, four, five. Um, additionally, you also get that omega C formula. Now in the, in the quiz, I gave you the topology and then you were supposed to plug in three and you didn't have to use the formula. So do realize that it's not going to be like exactly like the textbook, but slight variation, like very minimal slight variation. Very minimal. Um, yeah. For the high pass filters, you just need to know how to do the low pass design and how to convert into a high pass filter. And that's it. Um, yeah. So those are the two things. The If you need this formula, one over omega p, uh, what is it? One over omega P L equals C and L equals one over omega P C. Uh, that's not going to be given to you in the exam. So yeah, this is one that you'll have to actually memorize. Uh, and I think you're going to need it. So, okay. So that's, that's basically all of this for op amps. Just basically go through the slides. Uh, the textbook has a bunch of like formulas that they've derived and just solve some problems because it's just going to be a little triangle and a bunch of resistors and maybe some capacitors. Um, but yeah, there's not, it's just going to be like this is Vn, find Vn over V out, and then some kind of we are lumped element thing in between the, yeah. So it's just like an op amp wired in some kind of way and just very straightforward question. So to answer that question, all you need to do is practice so that you get fast at solving op amp circuits and you'll be fine. Uh, so yeah, so there's only one question. So that pretty much has completely saturated section two. Now, Section two, um, again, or so section three has three has four actually four questions. Question one is uh, it's supposed to be a confidence builder, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, so that's not the first question in the exam. Question. Four 
is pretty much uh, having to do with Wednesday's lecture. If you understood, uh, basically from looking at the this graph, what kind of MOSFET it is, or this graph, or from this graph, or whatever. Yeah, all of those, uh, so this would be VGS, and then this is ID, and then VGS and ID. If you, if you can basically identify the transistor from the plot, um, that's another MOS question that you will be good with. And then the other two MOS questions are basically Friday's lecture. So yeah, so that's basically it. Um, Okay, you haven't spent much time, that's good. Okay, so questions up to this point, I guess. What do you want me to do? You want me to go over this kind of stuff and then go to the questions or? Okay, I'll go over it again. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically high pass filters have Zero response when the omega is zero. You don't need, really need a limit here. You can just say h of j zero equals zero. Uh, same thing here, h of j zero does not equal zero. Um, so they have zero response for zero frequency and non-zero response for infinite frequency. If a circuit satisfies that, then it's automatically considered a high pass filter. That's why we just basically, if we see a circuit topology, um, we don't even need to evaluate the transfer function. We can just say, well, a capacitor at zero frequency behaves as an open, and then use that to figure out what the uh, voltage is. And then we can look at how the lumped element behaves at infinite frequency, which in this case, a capacitor behaves as a short. Then we realize that there's zero volts out. And so to determine whether any of these are, is being satisfied, all we have to do is just look at the two edge cases and then we're good to go. If we're not given a circuit and we're given a transfer function, then we actually have to go to these definitions. So we simply plug in zero on the frequency response. And then if we don't get zero, then that means that it's uh, either a low, it's a low pass basically at that point. If we get zero, then it's either high pass or band pass. Then we look at how it behaves as omega goes to infinity. Um, and then based on that, we can, if it's non-zero, then it's high pass. And if it's zero, then it's a bad pass. Yeah, so those are kind of the two main ways we went over in class. There's a third way using zeros and poles. So if there's no zeros, it's a low pass. Or if there's no zeros at zero, it's, it's a low pass. If there is a zero at zero, then you have to count the number of poles. If there's the no same number of zeros as poles, so here there would be one and one, that's a high pass. If I put another zero and then another pole, it's still a high pass. The moment the number of x's exceeds the number of zeros, it's a band pass. That's it. Um, logically, you can think about it from the, when you were plotting these frequency responses, you have to realize that the plot, because there's a zero at zero, starts at zero. And then every time there's a plot, there is a, a pole, the derivative is gonna decrease. In order to go from a positive derivative to a negative derivative at the end, you gotta have more poles than zeros. Uh, and so if you have the same number of poles and zeros, at the very end, you're just gonna have a flat derivative, which is a high class filter. That's kind of the reason why you just need to count the poles and zeros. Okay. So those are the three ways. There's not much else I can throw at you um, to test whether you know what a low pass, high pass, or band pass is. I guess I could show you these plots. That's a fourth way. So if I show you any of these plots, you should know. 
<laughs> which one it is. Okay, so here though, for the band pass, what is clear, but it's very critical that you know that HM is where the band pass response reaches the maximum. Omega M is the corresponding frequency. Omega high is the frequency at which it falls by three dB or the signal falls by one over the square root of two on the right-hand side. And then omega low is where that happens on the left-hand side or at the lower end of the frequency spectrum. Additionally, you should know that the bandwidth is actually the difference or the distance between omega high and omega low. If you know those things, I think uh, you'll be somewhat good. So you need to understand this plot. Um, additionally, you should ideally know how to derive HM from either of these circuits. Um, and if you're given something in this form, well, I'll, 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 if you need this formula, I'll give it to you, but you should basically also understand that You should know how to extract these values from the formulas, basically. Uh, I'm just going to leave it at that. OK. Low pass filter design. Um, if you want to kind of see the flavor of questions we ask, I recommend you just look at any low pass or high pass filter design question we've asked in the past. Um, the, they all have very similar flavor. So I think any practice exam question is very good practice. You need to know how to use this formula to get this number. Um, if you're given a list of these circuits, you should be able to figure out which one will work for a given set of specs. So basically, if I get that n-min has to be 1.7, that means that these four will work. If I uh, get that n-min is equal to 2.3, that means that these two will work. Once you, uh, if you're given these base circuits, you should be able to now figure out by how much you need to rescale or what omega c is and how to rescale the circuit to get the your design. Um, of course, this is ambiguous, right? Because it's going to give you a range from, uh, you can pick any number between whatever this value is and whatever this value is. So most likely in an exam, I'm going to have to either tell you, choose the minimum possible omega c which means you choose the smallest one or choose the maximum possible omega C, which means you choose the biggest one. Uh, because I have to make the exam deterministic. I can't, I can't just, yeah. It's, it's not the like, uh, it's not the wild west. Um, so just in, in real life, of course, you have some leeway on how to choose this omega C, but in the exam, I'm going to have to tell you either choose this one or choose that one. So, But it's not going to be anything different. It's going to be very, if you understand this process, you're good. Okay, here. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm just operating under the assumption you know how to design a low pass filter. So you just have to know how to change your high pass filter parameters into the equivalent low pass filter design parameters. And effectively, all you have to do is replace omega s with capital omega s, which is just little omega p divided by omega s. And then omega p gets replaced by omega p over omega s, which is just basically one. And then the omega cutoff, you're going to find the capital omega cutoff is just going to be omega p over omega c. Once you have these omegas, um, 
you just have to remember that you're just going to design a low pass filter with these as the pass band and stop band and cutoff frequencies. Then once you have your design, you should once you have a design coming out of this, this is critical, you should know how to convert it into a high pass filter design. So effectively, you're just going to take whatever you get from here and apply it. So do realize that the exam has limited time. There's a lot of arithmetic and a lot of things that could go wrong. So I might either tell you, find capital omega C, or I might tell you, uh, I might give you the circuit and I might tell you, find the high pass filter design. Or I might just ask you to give me what the new parameter values are for the equivalent low pass filter design. So, um, yeah, so if you know how to do every step, you're going to be good, but do realize that you're going to be given some intermediary step and you're going to be asked to take it to the next step. So you might be given step two and asked to go to step three or step three, go to step four, step one, go to step two and yeah. And then you turn around and then you do the hokey hokey. I don't know. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I'm not I'm not big on American music, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Just... <laughs> but anyway, so just just to, to realize that you it might be worded in a weird way, basically. That's what I'm trying to say, but it's actually very straightforward. The the question that I'm asking is, yeah, it's very straightforward. So if it doesn't look like I'm taking you from, I'm asking you to go from one step to another, reread the question. <laughs> yeah, like I said, operational amplifiers, I would highly recommend that you go home, you uh, basically practice applying these two relationships, which is that whatever this voltage is, is the same as this voltage and that no current flows through here. So what that means is that since this node has V in, this node has to have V in, then at that point I can apply KCL, and then there's three, three branches coming out of this node, but this branch gets no current, and so there's only two real branches, so I can just be like V in minus zero over R in, R in, RF, plus V in minus V out over RF equals zero. And then you just basically solve for V out over V in. And that's it. Um, yeah. This is like a cat. The exam question is like a tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, the, the point is, is that uh, you're going to have to basically just, it's the same stuff, but same kind of animal. One's a little wilder. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> Yeah, the, these active low pass filters might are, are not going to be in the exam. I'll, I might ask a question in the final. I just didn't have room for it. Um, and I also don't think this stuff is that interesting. If I'm completely honest. Uh, this this will probably there be one question in the final just because I have to ask a question about this. But yeah, for active low pass filters, you just have to remember that. Each of these stages behaves, this is like an inverting configuration. So you have basically Z out over Z in is the gain, or is the Z out over Z in? I'm gonna have to actually do this by hand. So this is Z out, this is Z in, and then you just basically say that the zero, minus Vn over Zn 
plus zero minus V out over Z out is equal to, okay, so now you get that V out is equal to Z out over Z in negative. So all this transfer function is, is just actually the ratio of the equivalent impedances of these two. Um, so what is it, the V out? And so as a result, all you have to do is choose your RO, CO, RI, CI to give you whatever um, pole or zero you would like. So if you want a, uh, so this actually, be, since these two things are in parallel, this becomes one over R in, plus SC in divided by one over R out plus SC out. So if you want like a transfer function that's one over S plus one, then you just simply choose R in to be one, C in to be zero, R out to be one, and C out to be one. If you want S plus three, you just replace R out with one third ohm. Uh, yeah, so actually a negative that, yeah, sorry. The, so there's not much here, basically. You're, you're gonna be given a transfer function and then you're gonna be asked to find the RI, CI, RO, CO that gives you that transfer, that's it. But, and this will not be in this exam, but it's gonna be in the final. So it's gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen soon. It's a tomorrow problem. Um, yeah, okay, so MOSFETs, I went through some very basic physics to give you a very slight intuition. I will say that I, yeah, I, I have a hard time preparing that lecture. I put an eight minute video on YouTube that probably did a, does a much better job than I would have done in class. So if you're interested in getting better intuition as to the inner workings of MOSFETs, just watch the little cartoon video. Um, for the exam though, okay, question one, I'm not gonna give you any hints, but seriously, like, <laughs> yes. I know there's gonna be one or two people that get it wrong, but it's okay. The, so, you need to basically know these symbols and what they mean. So I, if I give you a circuit, you need to know that this is that this arrow tells you in what direction ID is defined. And this arrow tells you that ID is defined. Note that here, which the textbook does this, which I'm not a big fan of, they flip the the orientation of the circuit symbol so that the source is now on top, do realize that for the PMOS and the NMOS, positive ID is defined in a different polarity. Even though if it, it's going up, up to down in the slide always, in this case, it goes from the drain to the source. In the PMOS, it goes from the source to the drain. So positive means in the direction of that arrow. And the direction of that arrow is defined by the type. So please make sure that uh, you keep a note of that, that ID positive is defined in this direction. So your circuit symbol tells you what is the positive ID. Otherwise, these equations don't work, basically. Um, and the reason you flip the polarity of ID uh, when you go from PMOS to NMOS is so that you can use the same equation for both PMOS and NMOS when you calculate ID. So it's, it's more of a matter of practicality. Um, what else is there here? Yeah, so this terminal, so when you see this, in, when you see a MOSFET in a circuit, you're not going to see these labels. And you just got to know that the arrow tells you where the S is. So you should know that the arrow tells you where the S is. 
And then the direction of the arrow tells you whether it's NMOS or PMOS, so if it's pointing in to the gate, it's a PMOS, if it's pointing out of the gate, it's an NMOS uh, or away from the gate. Additionally, if you have a thick channel, it's normally on, so it's depletion. Um, it's important that you know these things because we might not get, we might give you the absolute value of V threshold. And so you have to know the sign of V threshold just by looking at the symbol. So, so that's why it's important that you know these circuit diagrams. Um, so, because otherwise you won't know what sign of V threshold to plug in. And I think in the homework, there's some sample problems where they make you jump all hoops to figure out what the sign of V threshold is. and. Additionally, it's important that you know how to distinguish between these two so that you use the right inequalities. Okay, uh, questions up to now. Okay, so that's one thing about PMOS. Then the second thing about PMOS is that, like I said, if I told you that this is VGS and this is ID, what is a, uh, what kind of MOSFET head transistor is this? And what is it? NMOS yeah, it's an NMOS and depletion. So it's an NMOS because as I increase VGS in saturation, the current increases. Um, yeah, and then it's in depletion because when I have zero VGS, I can get non-zero ID. Now, what if I did this? Yeah, so now it's an enhancement PMOS and then this would be a depletion PMOS. Yeah, so if you, if you, you, you just need to play, or look at the plots that I put in the class, the little questions I asked and yeah, and then you'll be fine. So that's two questions down, two to go. Um, yeah, so second person kids, hard to time. Well, we have a lot of time. Okay. All right, let's go over some. Actually, is there are there any questions up to now that we want to roll the material? No, no questions. I'm gonna have to add some bonus questions just to make it harder. <laughs> okay, transfer function for the assuming L and B. Right? Okay, assuming L equals one, what is C R bandwidth quality factor? So if I showed you this plot, how do you know what R is? Uh, yeah, okay, so the peak occurs at resonance. And when the effective impedance of these two things in parallel is zero, and so the peak voltage should be I times R. And so the peak is actually R. So now R equals five ohms. Cool, so now we know R. <clears throat> and then um, additionally, what does uh, omega max tell us? I guess when does when do these two things cancel each other out? Yeah, and so that's also called so that would be the impedance C equivalent is equal to one over R plus uh, J omega. Uh, oh wait, one over J omega L plus J omega C, and then this should be J negative. Um, and so what what would the omega be when they cancel each other out? Oh, and this is to the negative one. When they cancel each other out. Yeah, so whenever this is zero, which means that uh, omega squared equals one over LC. And then the, yeah. So you know what L is. So how can you find C? 
because L was given to you, right? Yeah, exactly. So here you can just plug in one and then you know your omega max. So you just plug in two and so that's four and then C becomes one fourth. Uh, what else is there? Okay, so now we got to find the bandwidth. So what's five over the square root of two? You can also use the formulas for the bandwidth from the here. So if you write the transfer function, you can just read it off the second, the linear term. But for this, the bandwidth is actually uh, R over L. Okay, so the bandwidth is R over L. Wait, is it? It's not R over L. Sorry, sorry, this is, is this one. It's one over RC. That makes more sense. So one over RC, which is equal to one over five, is one over four, which is equal to four over five. So that means that the distance, so five, five divided by the square root of two, it would be like what, three? 3.5. So that means that this distance is about roughly 0.8. Yeah, and I mean, it looks like one, but I probably drew it too low, but. So this is what the bandwidth signifies, point, yeah. Okay, if you can actually, if you under, if you understood everything I just said, yeah, yeah, you got one less question to worry about. Find the frequency response of the parallel. So now we scale to get response in the bottom. Okay, if I want to get this response from this circuit, what do I have to do to it? So yeah, so we have to magnitude scale, but by how much? No, it it, it is then. Yeah, yeah. So because the, the units of this is impedance. Is it the yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, we need to multiply. So yeah, since the unit is impedance, you just multiply Km equals 10. And uh, because now we want 10 times higher of a response. Cool. Now, how do we figure out what how to frequency scale? So remember, we have H of J omega, it's gonna become H of J omega over KF, okay? I can pick two here and two now occurs at 80. So I know that H of two should be equal to uh, 80 over KF because the, the argument that I'm plugging in here has to be two. And the argument that I'm plugging in here has to be two. And so two has to be equal to 80 over KF. And 80 is what I plug into this function. And two is what I plug into this function. You know, I'm a lazy person. I don't like doing math. I'm just gonna go with one. So H of one has to be equal to 40 over KF. So what is KF? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so KF equals 40. All right, so now that you know these two, um, how do you find L? 
Yeah, so L equals KM over KF times L mu. So it's basically 10 over 40, so one over four. And then C, it's gonna be C over KM, KF, which is equal to, whoa, uh, one fourth, 40th, one fortieth square. And then, yeah, and then for R, what do you have to do for R? Yeah, so you just multiply it by KM. So KM times R, which is equal to five times 10, so it's just 40. Oh, this is actually 50. Okay, so yeah, 50. Huh? Yeah, five times 10, which is 50. Oops. Okay. So we're good here. Okay, perfect. We can still find some plus little part. We can see the. Yeah, so this is like test light. So you are given a circuit here, and then you're asked to frequency scale this circuit so that you get the following specs. Uh, but look at this thing. So how does that change this inequality when you're solving your test? Yeah, yeah, so it's equal to the left one. Yeah, so now all you gotta do is just basically take this number plug it in for here, take a max, plug it in here, take this number, plug it in here, take a min, plug it in here. Actually, you don't even need to do this one because you just need that one. And then how do you figure out the order? Yeah, so you have one plus one is two. So you get four. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. My account manager doesn't like that. <laughs> no, because there's a two here. So it's two times two is four. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So once you get those numbers, you got your omega C. But see, like here, you didn't have to calculate it in min because I gave you the low pass filter. So, so as you see, you only have to take it from step two to three, not from from the raw values to two or whatever. Question, yeah. Is it possible for you to give us like a high pass filter and say like frequency scale this with a low pass filter? Everything's possible because you haven't received the exam. It's like quantum theory. <laughs> it's both death and alive. <laughs> so. Yeah, so let's say I, I, I I actually like this question. Let's say I give you this circuit and I ask you to design a circuit with this response. So based on what we learned in class, what do I have to do to go from a circuit that look that has this response to a circuit that looks like has this response? Change the pass. Exactly. So all you gotta do is take every inductor L and replace it with a capacitor with a capacitance equal to one over, so C nu, uh, one over L, which in this case, it would just be this one over, one over the square root of two, which is just equal to the square root of two. Um, and then, so basically you just take this inductor and here, so let me just draw the circuit to be more explicit. I need to get square root of two. And then this one gets replaced with an inductor and the inductor will be L nu equal to one over C, which is equal to one over the square root of two. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's how you go from this transfer function to this transfer function. Um, Let's say I 
I'm an evil person and I decide to make this omega p over omega, what would change? So would it go in the numerator or denominator? No. Yeah, it goes in the denominator. So without you changing it, you're just saying omega p equals one from the second trick potentially. Yeah, 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 basically. It's like basically two wrongs make a right. Like here, I'll, I'll, I'll go through the process with you. So we need this thing in the numerator, right? So we're going to frequency scale this thing by kf equal to 1 over omega p, so that then it becomes 1 over the square root of 1 squared plus omega p omega to the fourth. And then we do a, what is it? A, a low, what is it? a low pass to high pass conversion so that we replace every omega with one over omega. So that now we go to one over the square root of one squared plus omega P over omega to the fourth. So let's see what happens to the freak, to the actual circuit components. Well, L goes to become omega P times L uh, going from the KF equal to one over omega P. C goes to omega P times C because the, the frequency factor is one over. And then in the low pass, to high pass, then it becomes one over omega P L equals C and one over omega P C equals L. Does that make sense? It's like plain lights out. So you basically like first do the little thing, you get your omega P. Now you gotta get this omega in the numerator. So you do another conversion and now you got what you wanted. Anyway, if you're not confused right now, you're good. Um, if you weren't confused before, you're you're good. <laughs> okay. Is anyone go ahead? Yeah. So shouldn't you be frequency scaling it KF equals omega so it becomes like omega over omega p? Because remember that you replace every omega with omega over KF. Yeah, so when you replace it with omega over kf, right, that becomes your new omega. And then when you replace the inductors with the capacitors, it becomes one over your new omega, which is omega over kf. So that it becomes like omega p over omega. Okay, you can think about it in two ways. Either you, you frequency scale the low pass filter by this, or you frequency scale the high pass filter by KF equals omega P. Um, but th those are the only two ways you can think about it. Does that make no sense to you? So just remember that if I were to frequency scale this thing, right? Every omega would get replaced by omega over KF. So then that KF would end up in the numerator. No, that I understand, but like for the first one, why can't we replace the omega with like omega over KF, right? And then we, when we do that conversion, it becomes one over- No, because then we're just going to get omega P in the numerator, in the denominator. When we do the, we only flip the omegas, this becomes a constant in the function. That's not a parameter, that's just a constant. So it stays at the num so so when we we need to make sure that it's already in the right position here. Because the only thing that changes whenever we do these tricks is wherever there's an omega. 
the omega p is not a variable, it's just a number. Makes sense. Yeah, other questions? Okay. Yeah, so just okay yeah yeah so what's the what what would you plug in here for omega p if you were given this yeah 100 exactly okay that's good if you understand these examples really well, I think you understand the concept. I don't, these are actually really good questions, the ones that I'm asking. Um, yeah. The low pass filter, find HW. Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting question that you might want to practice with. Um, do you all want me to go over this or are you happy with no? Go <laughs> the class is having an argument here, but I'll go over it. Um, since I'm asking for h of j omega, we can just solve this in the phaser domain. So this is just one over j omega two, and this is one over j omega. And then at this point, all you gotta do is just uh, apply k c l at each node, so if this is V2, what does that mean about this voltage? Yeah, exactly. So this is V2, which means that this is V2. Um, and so at that point, you really have uh, two nodes. You have this node, and then you have this node. So for this node, you have that V2 minus 0 over 1 over j omega plus v2 minus va over the square root of 2 over 2 equals 0. Um, uh, uh, and then now you can do a loop, a, another kind of equation for this node. So now you have va minus v2 over the square root of 2 over 2 plus v a minus v one divided by the square root of two over two plus v a minus v two over one over j omega two. That should all sum up to zero. And now your goal is to basically get rid of all the v a's to find the ratio of v one and v two. So you can basically take this equation here and solve for VA in terms of V2 and then back substitute it for VA here and here and here. And then after a lot of, you kind of get the answer basically. Um, and apparently the answer is this. I'm not gonna go over it because I just think at this point it's just algebra. You have two equations, two unknowns. I will say going through this exercise is a good, good practice because the uphand question, like this is very basic. Where it's gonna get you is that it has a lot of steps and you need to kind of do it a lot so that you develop like the muscle memory and it just becomes, Boom, 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 bah. Like, <laughs> like if you, yeah, but you just need to do it a lot. That's like the only way it's gonna happen. Like that the theory is very basic, right? You just kind of go through the notes and then you write out all the terms and then you have this mess and then you're like, what do I combine? Uh, but to know what do you combine, you have to just do it and do it and do it and do it. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's just skip this one. Yeah, all of these are really good practice examples. I've already asked these questions. Uh, the negatives. Yeah, so let's say I, I, I can also ask these questions. Actually, 
engineering students, when I show them these plots, they're all like, yay. And then you ask them questions like these. I, I know because I have statistical data. It's it's like they break down. Like <laughs> so if I basically if I increase VGS, if I have a transistor somehow and I increase VGS and all of a sudden I see that the current increases, what kind of transistor is this? Yeah, exactly. And MOS. So just remember that translates to a plot. Uh, where you have this, and basically, as I move VGS, if I'm in saturation, the current will increase. If I'm not in saturation, just by looking at these plots, as I increase the value of VGS for a fixed VDS, you can see that the current increases. So remember that um, this goes from VGS equals 2, negative 2, and 0. So you see that the negative two, which is the smallest value of VGS, has the lowest current for a given VDS, and then the next one, and then so you automatically know just by these plots encode this sentence basically, or this sentence encodes this plots. I think it works a little bit better. I think this only has seven words. This has a thousand. So anyway, um, I have a negative VGS, and I still get current. So it's the same transistor, same transistor. Now there's a negative VGS and you get some current. So is it enhancement, depletion? What is it? Yeah, so it's a normal Leon transistor because a negative VGS still gives you, it's an N-type where a negative VGS still gives you current. Uh, da, da, da. Well, this should be decreased, not decreased. Okay. I decrease VGS and the current increases. So now that would be. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be violent with the. <laughs> so basically, it's just a P type. And then. Um... So now, if you have a VGS of one and you do not get current, what does that mean? What kind of transistor is this? Is it enhancement? <laughs> what? So just remember the inequalities are reversed. So effectively in, in P world, positive means negative. And so uh, this actually does not give you enough information. Actually, it says enhancement. What? Wait, I have VGS equals one volt and do not get current. Oh. The B threshold. Oh, sorry, sorry. It says assume B threshold absolute value is less than one. Okay. Because B threshold is less than one, in absolute sense. So let's look at this. So remember that the current, so B threshold can either be, so this is negative, this is positive one, this is negative one. Um, and B threshold can be anywhere between these kind of two numbers. And since so this is a PMOS, it looks like this, but now it's telling me that at one, I don't get any current. Yeah, I don't know. This this is a typo. Yeah, th th this just don't pay attention to this question. But yeah, that don't don't pay attention to this last question. Um, yeah, so just make sure though that you under if you if these same things are written in like plain text, you should be able to translate to what they mean in the plot. Okay, bias circuit, which I think we are. I guess show of hands, how many of you want me to go over this, or we can just wait till tomorrow to I guess minority wins.
Well, we have 30 minutes and I'm out of material, so I will go over it. And I wait, no, 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 don't, I don't want to end. Okay, hold on. Let me turn it back. Are there any questions before I move into this about the material I've gone over so far? How do people feel about the exam? Good? Okay. I'm gonna have to make it harder. <laughs> uh, okay. So first of all, the the strategy that we're gonna adopt for analyzing MOSFET circuits is we're always going to assume that the circuit is in saturation. So that's step one. Assume saturation. We will solve the circuit and then we will check whether we are in saturation or not. If we're not, then we will assume that we're in triode, solve the circuit again, and then check to see if we're in triode region, and if we're not, then that means the circuit isn't caught up and the ID is zero. Uh, for the exam, you can just assume the circuit is in saturation and it will be in saturation. In the homework, there are some examples where it isn't. Okay, so now let's analyze the circuit and it actually, is not as hard as you would think. So one approach that I almost always have taken is just to use Ohm's law as much as possible to analyze these circuits. So basically, what is VG? So first of all, how much current goes into this gate terminal? Wait, actually, we haven't talked about that. So the gate has zero current going into it. So the, the you see this little gap here? That means it's like an open circuit. Actually, towards the end of class, we'll actually see how the gate actually behaves like a capacitor. But we're assuming that the frequency, actually, we're doing DC analysis, so the frequency is zero. So this gate behaves like an open. So we basically have zero current going this way, um, which means that Whatever current flows through here is the same as the current that flows through here. And what is another name of this like circuit on the left? Yeah, so it's just the voltage divider. So that means that VG equals the voltage at the top minus the voltage at the bottom divided by the total resistance, so 500, plus RG or 300 plus RG2 plus RG2 and then times RG2. Okay, that's the basically how you can figure out that's that's always going to be the equation to find the gate voltage for this type of circuit topology. In this case, VDD is five and VSS is zero. I could have drawn this circuit like this and it makes no difference um, because this node equation still only has one current and one current coming out. Uh, so sometimes in the book, they write, they draw the circuit like this. No, this is the same circuit. Okay. Uh, okay, so just that's, Kind of one thing you can find VG. You can also write an equation for. First of all, you need to figure out in what direction does ID flow, and how do you do that? Yeah, so you look at the source terminal where the arrow sits, and then you look at that arrow, and then you see, realize that it points goes down. Okay, so. We know the voltage here is VD or five volts. So what's the voltage here? Well, and then we also know that ID flows through here and ID flows through here. Yeah, so basically you have VD is equal to, 
of VDD minus the voltage drop IDRD. And then uh, using the same kind of logic, what is VS? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure, yeah, it's zero. But it's also V, what is it? The VS is actually equal to V, what is it, SS? VSS plus ID RS. So the voltage here is VSS, and from here to here, because it's in the opposite, you just add ID times RS. From these three equations, you can figure out what VDS is by taking this equation, subtracting it from this equation. You can figure out what VGS is by taking this equation, subtracting it from this equation. Once you have these three equations, you add to it the equation for saturation, and then you have everything you need to solve this problem. At this point, you don't even need to look at the circuit anymore. Okay, now let's let's actually read the question, what it's actually asking after. <laughs> okay, so it's asking what is IG? Um, well, IG is zero. In what direction does current flow? Well, we already answered that. Okay, so it's telling us to assume ID equals one milliamp, KN equals two, V threshold equals one, lambda equals zero, and we're in saturation. It's asking us for VG and RG2. Okay, so we're in saturation. So what is ID? So that's equal to KN over two VG minus VS minus V threshold squared. Okay, that's that's the a formula that you will get in the exam. It's the saturation formula. Of course, VG minus VS is really just VGS. So I just wrote it in this form because we have this thing here and we have this thing here. And I wrote it in equation form, but this is really zero. And this is zero, so Vs is actually zero. So what is Vs? Yeah, so it's just, you plug in zero here. We said Rs was zero, so zero plus zero is zero, so zero. We have B threshold, which equals one. And then we have Kn, which equals two. And then we were told that uh, ID is equal to one. So we're given this in milliamps, but notice that this has units milliamps, so we're good. At this point, uh, well, can anyone tell me what VG is? <laughs> yeah, so two minus one gives you one, one squared equals, why is it not, uh, equal to zero. It could be zero, right? Zero also works. Yeah, so if we plug in two here, remember that to be in such a, first of all, to not be in cut up, we need that VG S is greater than or equal to V threshold, which means that uh, if V threshold is one and VS is zero, that means that VG has to be cannot be negative one, or sorry, cannot be zero. Um, it's set to assume saturation, but what do we need for saturation? So as you practice, you need to memorize these inequalities, but basically you need that VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus V threshold. So what is VDS? Well, we have five. We were given ID, which is one. What is RD? Oh, it's asking us the last question is what is the maximum possible for RD? Oh, well, okay. So 
Okay, so to find the maximum value of Rd, we actually need to put this back into the inequality and then solve for Rd, uh, the biggest Rd that allows us to do this. But because remember that, but let's just uh, GSFD, maximum possible for Rd. And yeah, so basically, you know, VG. RG2, you can find from using this voltage divider. So if you need, what is it, two volts here, that means that this needs to be 200. Because there's a five volt drop between the top and the bottom. Proportionality. Um, yeah, so that's basically it. So here you got the two volts, 300. And then now we're using the inequality that I wrote in the previous slide. And we have that VDS is equal to five minus IDRD. And then you can solve for RD to get that. RD has to be at most four kiloamps, four kilo ohms. This is a convoluted question because it's not asking you the straightforward thing, which is we give you the resistance values, we give you the voltage values, and then we ask you what ID is or what VDS is. Um, but in general, the approach is the same. You will always, if you're ever stuck, these equations are always true. Uh, VSS. So where this is VSS, this is VDD. And uh, from these equations, you can just basically take this equation, uh, subtract from it this equation, and then you're gonna get VGS. Take this equation, subtract from it this equation, you're gonna get VDS. Um, and then the final equation is of course, given to you from the saturation condition. Um, that will be all of the equations that you can get out of the circuit. And from those equations, you will always be able to find an answer. Um, yeah, so. If you're able to write those four equations and solve them, you're good. Okay, assume saturation. This is this this we're not it's not gonna be in the exam. This is for the final. This is the other circuit that we're gonna go over tomorrow. Um I think I'm gonna actually Let's let's go over the circuit since we have 10 20 minutes to burn. Okay, what is the region of what what is the value of V G for this circuit? Yeah. So V G equals V D. Uh, and then what is V S for both of these transistors? Yeah, so it's just zero. So uh, Vs equals zero. So that means that Vgs equals Vds. Um, now it's telling us that V threshold equals one. So Vgs minus V threshold minus one, is that greater than or, or less than Vds? So less than VDS. So what's the region of operation of this transistor here? Yeah, it's in saturation because basically VGS is less than V threshold. It could also be in cutoff, but then I gave you this extra information that tells you it's not. Um, because VD is greater than V threshold. So that means that VGS minus one is greater than zero. Okay, the, okay, so now we know what this is, saturation. Okay, so if this circuit here is in saturation, uh, and we're told that ID equals one amp, then what is one milliamp, then what is the amount of current flowing through this branch? 
sorry, what's R, sorry. And what is VD? What's our sorry? Okay. So you have five volts minus R times one. So five volts minus R times one milliamp uh, is equal to VD. And then you also have that ID is equal to K over two V G minus V S minus V threshold square. So now I'm just gonna plug in one here and we have the V S is zero. And then we have V G is actually equal to V D. Um, and also this is equal to one milliamp. Um, and so, and then K is two. So now we can actually solve basically these two equations. So you can just plug this in for VD and then solve for R, and then you can figure out what R is. So that's, this is the equation I just wrote in the previous slide. And this is the saturation condition. And then um, you can solve for VG and then solve for R basically. Okay, so now we know that this is 3000 ohms, three kilo ohms. Okay, so let's assume that Q1 and Q2, so both of these transistors are identical. They're like, they're twins. Oh, 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 well, what is the amount of current flowing through this branch? Yeah, it should be basically the amount of current flowing through this branch is actually equal to the amount of current flowing through this branch. Why do you think that is? Yeah, because it's a <laughs> but in particular, you have here that the VGS of this transistor it's the same as the VGS of this transistor. But remember that the, the fact that the VGS of this transistor is the same, that means that in saturation, ID or the maximum current, you can think of it as a maximum current you can get out of this transistor, it's just gonna be one milliamp. That's the maximum current you're gonna get out of it. Um, and you will get this current as long as VDS is greater than or equal to VGS minus V threshold. And in this particular case, we have a two kilo ohm. So we have basically five minus 2000 times one milliamp, which is equal to three which is greater than or equal to uh, two minus one. So as a result, indeed, this branch is also in saturation. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. So as a result, it's in saturation, the bias is, in, is the same, and so you must get the same current. When when will I get less than one milliamp? Do you, does anyone know? Yeah, so that's one. Um, but let's say I, I let's say I change this resistance. Now I want to put a bigger resistor here because I, I bought some new speakers and they are much bigger. So now they're four kilo ohms. Um, would I still be in saturation? So if I plug in four here then I'm gonna get one. So I'm still in saturation, I'm still good, but you know, I'm greedy. So now I go and I buy some even bigger speakers and now I'm not gonna be in saturation. And so I'm gonna get less current. 
So this is actually important because basically when you have a current source, it's gonna typically behave ideal as long as you connect a small enough resistance. So this thing, as long as you connect less than or equal to four, four kilo ohms, you're gonna get one, one milliamp through this branch. Now, what would happen if I... All of the sudden, added another identical transistor to this thing. How much current would flow through the circuit? Yeah, exactly, two milliamps. But wait, 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 wait. What do we have to check before we know that it's two So we know the maximum absolute current that can flow. What do we have to check? Yeah, whether we're in saturation. So now we, we're back to our two kilo ohm resistor. So now we plug in two milliamps. Yeah, and we're in saturation, so we're good, yeah. But now if we try to go, if I try to put on my big speakers, um, yeah, there's no party because I won't be in saturation. So then it won't be two milliamps. So you notice something really interesting here that I can, I can also like double my current source, but now I have to put a lower resistance to maintain that ideal behavior. So there's no free lunch, you know, the, this product IV um, it, you're not going to magically increase it. Yeah. Um, tomorrow we're going to actually look at in more detail and much more organized way these circuits. But these are the two circuits that you need to understand for your exam. Yeah.